We're delighted to welcome Granville Han Hancocks to Morley. Uh, Granville Hancocks to Morley is a professor of music and well-being. Granville has practiced, performed, and advocated engagement in singing and health for over 30 years. And many of you will know Granville as a marvelously musical motivator, uh, living out in really practical ways the impact of music as a force for good within society. It's a real pleasure to have you here, Granville, and we look forward to everything you're going to tell us. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, an, an honour, in fact, to be here, because we are in this hall celebrating one of the great female uh, activating persons of the 19th century. And it's so appropriate that we should actually, as Andrew says, be, be following on from the roots that were laid here in terms of actually engagement with learning. We'll come on to that in a moment, but well, first of all, actually, there's some gaps in this uh, uh, auditorium. I want you to move. First of all, I just want you to move. Uh, if there's a gap, go and sit by somebody else. And then I want the uh, first thing, second thing I want you to do is actually um, say hello to somebody you never said hello to before. If you could do that now, quickly. Hello. 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 Oh, right. <laughs> I used to belong to the Petrical Theatre. Uh, so we used to perform and do shows. We've already by the fact that we've actually said hello to each other. And we are tapping into an evolutionary process which is about us being social beings. We are actually a social animal. And we need each other. And I could have gone on to actually suggesting that instead of just actually saying hello, you actually preened each other. <laughs> so we'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> 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 well, that's involved, but anyway. Yes, that's right. Feel safe in your place. All right, okay. So the second, the second point is actually, you've reacted in a way to that suggestion that you preen each other by laughing. Yeah? So our laughter is uh, uh, another important element that we're going to refer to a little while later in this talk, in this presentation. So, uh, if I shout 82, it's because that's the number of the person coming through the door right now. So the next one will be 82. So if I shout 82, that's why. You'll understand. And if somebody else comes in, it'll be 83. You got the idea? Fine, okay, fine. Excellent, okay. So, um, I, 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 yippee, I, I, a. I, 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 yippee, I, I, a. Bonny, bonny, bon. My bonny, 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 bon. My bonny. Got it? Good. I, 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 yippee, I, I, a. I, 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 Just 
Take your arm back and sing. Go, go.
This idea then of the brain being completely activated by signaling is really important. So how we got here then? Well, of course, it's an evolutionary process that we've, we've gone through. And our, our uh, ancestors from the Australopithecus Afrolensis right through to Homo sapiens, where we are now, before us, the Neanderthal, actually have gone from quadruped to biped slowly. So our, our forebears are <coughs> quadrupeds moving around on all fours, coming up to much more like what we have as our ancestors in terms of the apes, and then through to the Neanderthal, which looks very similar to us, and now Homo sapiens, where we are. So all the time, this, deep, this evolution has been going on. Singing or sound making has been a fundamental part the thing that's actually joined us, all these people, all these men and women, have been joined by the fact that they've been making sound from 300, 400, 2,000 years ago. So, two kinds of, of, of people we're talking about, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on, or oh, stopping about Neanderthals because Neanderthals and Homo sapiens actually seem to be hardwired to sing, hardwired to make sound in some way that we now consider to be singing of some sort. So I wonder if this is the case. So we go on. Thanks, Joe. Our ancestors, our quadrupeds, not far in advance of that march of man that I just showed now, were looking like this, or rather, also sounding like this. Groups of mothers and their young gather together to form troops of up to 800 monkeys. Janada's hands are usually busy plucking grass instead of grooming. So to keep in touch, Janada's have become the chattiest to all monkeys. The gossipy banter can sound to scientists like sentences with words or even names for each other. Most agree it's often used to defuse tension. And in Janada's, there's a lot to be tense about. <laughs> okay, so the Gilada baboon, one of their very close ancestors. If you notice that, that, that sequence there, David Attenborough there, there, okay, large numbers of Gilada baboons in a social group. Yeah? He mentioned about preening and eating. Now what's happening, just like when we shook hands and when the gelada preens, is that their brains, our brains, are in some way activated. We have a reaction to each other in that way. So the gelada baboons, as our ancestors, when they were preening each other, were releasing chemicals in the brain associated with social bonding, associated with love, associated with uh, cohesion of identity, all those elements that there. So the, the endorphins being released in the brain in the gelada, similar to the endorphins being released with you when you're actually shaking hands or embracing or giving each other a hug or whatever it is. <coughs> Physical contact, absolutely essential in that way. So the problem is, as you saw, that those large, large groups of geladas run out of time in trying to get round to, to prune each other, preen each other, <laughs> prune, <laughs> preen each other, insufficient time to actually get round to each other. So we have to replace that element in some way. So the evolutionary process we'll be talking about is this.
this idea of replacing the preening that allows us to express and, uh, uh, emotions, to actually develop the brain engagement, this has to be replaced with some other activity because we, we become time short in this brain. That's the next one. Now, we go back and or go forward to the idea of the evolution from the Gilada Babu to Neanderthal man. It's inconceivable, don't you think, that such extraordinary images that we are used to now seeing from, in fact, from different hemispheres of the world. The, the bottom left uh, example is from an Australian Aboriginal uh, uh, painting. The one bottom right is from uh, what we know now as France, Europe. And the famous one at the top is also from France. Of actually Neanderthal man or similar woman developing conceptually in such a way that actually identity is important. This is me. Okay? This is this is representation of me. What? And secondly, that actually they're aware of the environment and the and, and society around them. It happens to be made up of, of animals or creatures or mythological <coughs> I ideas. So the brain developing at a huge rate here. So conceptual ideas of being able to refer to something other than themselves, refer to themselves in terms of the hand there, the handprint there, and then also in developing the brain in such a way that imagination can take off as well. So myths and legends start to be created in this way. So it's inconceivable that level of sophistication could actually not be mirrored by the use of sound in some way. It's, it just would not happen, would it? You can't imagine people actually sort of sitting around reflecting on the bison or the, or the alligator or whatever creatures around and actually not being engaged in sound making in some way. So we go to the next slide. We have some potentially uh, an example of what sounds might have been like with Neanderthal. Now, here's the problem. It's always the problem with music, isn't it? Always the problem in terms of sound, that we have to wait for many, many, many hundreds of years before we can record it in any way other than notate it. It's very difficult to record until we've got the machinery. So, a hundred years ago here, in fact, would be that we were right on the cusp, cutting edge of being able to record sound in some way. And yet, Neolithic, Neolithic man, Neanderthal man, could actually record images on walls. So, this research by David Ludman and, and people like that might suggest that exploration of, of caves, of the sorts of areas that would actually also have cave paintings on their walls were absolutely ideal for sound making. So if we hear this, this is a recreation. This is not, a, you know, this isn't real. <laughs> okay, this is a recreation. <laughs> Discovered 
but they were also great locations to generate reverber reverberant sound. So, let me just recap. We are wired, hardwired for making sounds. Yeah? We come from an evolutionary, on an evolutionary process of brain development that has sound completely and utterly hardwired in its, uh, in, in, in its, in its development there. And going out and using sound, or coming into the cave to use sound, was normal. Singing Neanderthals were pretty cool people, I think. <laughs> and this marvelous book by Stephen Mithen actually gives a great insight into the, the hypothesized world of the Neanderthal and what's happening with, with, uh, with the development of the brain and the body. And if I just read a little section of this book by Mithlin, uh, he suggests this. Um, one of the key aspects in the previous chapter was about the physical helplessness of human infants at birth. As I explained, the evolution of bipedalism resulted in a relative narrow pelvic girdle and hence birth canal, which limits the size of infants at birth especially their brain size. To compensate, infants were effectively born premature and continue rapid fetal growth rates for the first year of life outside the womb. So if you think about it with Homo sapiens too, it's the case, is it not? We, that's is mankind, ladies, you give birth to you infants, and the infant is essentially premature. And it's totally and utterly dependent. If we think about infant development, the rate of development in the first 12 months is absolutely incredible. Brain size, head size, body size, normally expanding at a, developing at a, a, a huge rate in that way. Interestingly, away from quadruped to biped, we put the baby down. And the baby, of course, has no other way of communicating other than using sound. Ah, 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 ah. Intoning, using sound, very limited use of sound to be able to express every desire, every element of, of, of life at that moment. I'm, I'm in trouble, I need help, I'm hungry, I'm uncomfortable, I'm in pain. Ah! Or through non-language based sound making. Yep. And what's our response? Our response is actually to go to sound. So we put the baby down and separate from the body as opposed to the jar of both baboon who's still actually having the baby strapped or on its back or whatever. We're actually putting the baby down and we respond to sound in that way. First thing. Second thing is that actually we respond to the sound by picking up the infant and then singing, making a sound in some <coughs> way as a response to if it's distress, actually starting to imitate the, the womb maybe, internally womb, making sounds that have actually been familiar across the womb before the birth, or actually newly composed things that we, you know, now know as lullabies in that way. So this idea then of the baby, the infant, being absolutely dependent upon sound is within us all in that way, within us all. So, we've come along this journey, and by this time in our journey, we've got music is ingrained in our cultural, social development. Uh, music as in terms of sound manipulation. Yeah. Because I'm talking cross culturally, cross globally, not talking about Western music in, in that way. The evolutionary process requires separation of premature human infant from another. Sound the only means of communication from one to another. And development, therefore, 
of emotional language before conceptual language, before language as such. So we can say, oh, let's all try it now, go. Ah. Oh. Okay, there you are, you see, you're well practiced in, in oh, isn't that a lovely baby? Ah, oh. oh, what a beautiful dog. Oh. And then we add another element to that, in fact, to make you sort of... <laughs> we, we use breath and laughter as a part of the reaction to another human being in that way. This man is an extraordinary researcher, Robin Dunbar. He's an evolutionary biologist who works at Oxford. And his work is absolutely staggering on the development of the human in all sorts of ways. But he's made some extraordinary, extraordinary discoveries uh, and hypotheses about the importance of singing and dancing in, in terms of our development. And he develops this idea I just talked a, a little earlier on about the Gillard of Baboon, running out of time <laughs> that the larger number of, of members of a, a group there are, then we run out of time. We have to replace the preening idea with something else, first thing. Second thing is that he developed what's now known as the Dunbar number, 150. 150, he suggests, Robin Dunbar suggests, is the maximum number of people you can have in a meaningful group so that you can just about be in touch. So he's suggesting that people with Facebook accounts of 972 <laughs> that can't really know each other terribly well in that way. And what's interesting, he makes the point about 150 is in the Doomsday survey of, uh, uh, of the, after the Norman Conquest, the Doomsday survey, the villages in, in the majority of English villages were about 150 mm -hmm. in total. There were some exceptions in Kent, and I think Ford, which was one of them, uh, Roger, in, in that way, that they were, they were actually smaller than that. But 150 seems to be a, a very interesting number. So Robin Dunbar, I recommend him to you. And here's what he says about his research through there and again we pick that up as uh, the size of that those connected areas again correlates with the number of friends you have and how good you are at um, mentalizing so what this does now is is essentially allow us to see both how you get this relationship between brain size and group size in effect but more importantly uh, allows us to figure out what the mentalizing levels of different species of hominins are at least these are data from uh, different species of monkeys and apes. It's plotting total amount of time data. The percentage of daytime devoted to social activity against average group size for that species. And uh, in general, there's sort of uh, a, a nice linear relationship. The bigger the group, the more time you have spent socializing. Although it kind of tails off. This is really under pressure from time budgets because at the end of the day, all the rest of that time has to be devoted to uh, feeding and foraging. So, the point about that, are you alright? Oh, nothing's just happened. <laughs> this is Joseph, by the way. Thank you very much, Joseph, for, for sorting out the technique. <laughs> okay. So, Robin's making this point then, that we, foraging and feeding, preening, we're running out of time. Something's got to replace that. And his hypothesis is, and I think it's a really convincing one, is that we replace that preening with making sound with starting to sing, and to dance, and to laugh. So we use laughter, dancing, and singing cross-culturally, so we, you know, this is globally, in this, in, oh well, you know, Africa, into Europe, in the development of, 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 of mankind, as we know it, is actually bursting out in these, in these three important areas. Actually, laughter, dancing, and singing, which makes us huge. So if, if these successive populations and these species of our ancestors up to us are having to find this amount of time, it's pushing them way above 
what time budgets they actually have. And what we think happened was they introduced, or we successively introduced, these three steps to fill that gap. And we think they came in, we now think they came in at these particular points here, laughed at uh, with the appearance of early homo, allowing that jump up that you see very dramatically here through the heavy lines here up to homo ergaster. Uh, singing and dancing essentially uh, with the appearance of archaic humans, uh, and finally the rituals, the religion, but very late. Okay. And, and we just get that. suggest that simply because the very latest thing that religion in that sense that you have rituals <laughs> requires language, and we think language is extremely late. Exactly. Probably not good. <laughs> so religion and ritual has to come after we've developed singing, dancing, and laughter, because it's, <laughs> it's language developed. It's language dependent. Yeah. So we're, anti we're anticipating the development of language by, by the use of our uh, uh, singing. Uh, lastly, just this, the last the example of Robin Dunbar's work is this whole idea of when we're singing, when we're laughing, we're actually releasing these endorphins in the brain, which allows us then to resist things like pain rather better than when we're not laughing or singing or dancing. So my original point about you know, the, the brain being completely flooded with Rachel when she was playing her flute, uh, was getting away from uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. In the same way, laughter allows us to resist pain. We're interested in endorphin release, endorphins are part of the pain control system, but they don't cross across the blood-brain barrier, so you can't measure them very easily directly uh, without going to putting people to an awful lot of uh, trouble and pain. So what everybody does in the pain industry is they use uh, pain thresholds as a proxy for that. So we take a pain uh, threshold measure, something like an old-fashioned um, uh, blood pressure monitor on your arm, how long can you stand it? Uh, you do an activity, watch a video, or do an activity, you might be dancing or singing or something, and then retest the pain. If there's an increase in pain threshold across here, it's because you have had endorphins uh, released. And so here's a summary of six different experiments we've done with laughter. These, they're, they're, they all involve an experimental group that watches a comedy, stand-up comedy video, so there's somebody like Michael McIntyre here, and they always do it in groups of four, uh, because people don't laugh when they watch the stuff. It's amazing. You get, people are 30 times more likely to laugh at the same video if they watch it in groups of four than if they watch it on their own. It's an incredibly social thing, laughter. And then we want to have a control group, which is completely neutral and produces no laughter. Uh, uh, so what we found is the best one of the lot is golfing instruction videos. <laughs> <laughs> Well, most of these are done in the lab, except for this one. I, I really love this, because we did it live at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So this group were watching stand-up comedy shows, and this lot were watching little plays, drama that's non-humans. But as you can see, in general, all the groups in, which were watching comedy laughed a lot, pain threshold increases, here's zero, no change. All the ones watching neutral videos, no laughter, pain threshold is either unchanged or has dropped. Uh, is negative. Okay. So, and we've shown exactly the same thing with dancing. Same, exactly the same thing with dancing and singing and laughter. So the pain threshold goes up. A hundred years ago, remember that Andrew's reference to uh, sighting in Kerwin and, and, and so forth here. Imagine that a, a different society actually which is, is, is experiencing a lot of pain in terms of all sorts of things. Let, an example in the a bit later on, let's say in the 1920s, 19, uh, early 20s, of actually going down into the ground and digging up coal out of the ground for 12 hours a day. And what do men do when they come out? They spend three nights a week singing in that way. Or they sing, or we have an idea of saying we sing together, actually we're in, we're in, in a dangerous situation to actually bring us together, to actually make us feel more secure, all those things, all related to these, the release of these endorphins and neurotransmitters, hormones from the brain, oxytocin, serotonin, cortisol, dopamine, and other endorphins in that way. 
So, we're reliant upon that happening without us thinking about it. We're reliant upon, uh, now, replacing that because we've, society's changed. We're reliant upon it because the time factor actually has changed, so we need to replace what we're doing and singing and dancing, we good examples of, of that. Okay, this is a massive leap in time then from uh, where we've just been in prehistory to, to where we are right now. And we're just going through this idea of, in musical terms, if you like, as we go from sound manipulation to making music, and I'm going to think about at the moment just a sort of Western tradition, just because it's convenient to do that. From a starting point at the top of the triangle, yeah, we had a very narrow field of expectation, style, development, whatever, to a huge, absolutely outpouring of difference to where we are right now. And yet the thing that actually cements all those things together, it's a line going down the middle of that triangle, is the fact that we are motivated, we are affected in the same way as from the starting point as to where we have any, any place upon, on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the baseline there. So when Holst was here a hundred years ago writing The Planets, okay, the emotion that he's able to convey in his music is actually the very same chemical process that's going on in our brain then as it is now. And so he's able to communicate an emotional response in us because of that, that whole physical engagement. All right, very quickly, we just go on then. So we've divided uh, ourselves. We've, we've moved away from the idea, I think, that we've had for such a long time, until maybe Descartes, that the mind and body was completely cemented together. There was no difference. It's a holistic view. And you know, if we look at, at a, a Greek example of great Greek uh, philosophers, philosophers like Pythagoras, who's, who's absolutely captivated by the, the whole notion of sound and the relationship between sound, man, and the, the universe in that way. So music and mundana, the music of the spheres, the whole aspect of actually going outside ourselves and finding another world in that way, but also being absolutely captivated by the physical nature of sound and developing, for instance, the, the harmonic series or noting how a harmonic series develops. And that's uh, that Plato is relating the Pythagorean developments in sound to the whole idea of this connection between mind and body. And will not our musician pursuing the same trail in his gymnastics as he please get to have no need of medicine, say when indispensable? So we can have a better quality of life, bringing together mind and body through the medium of something like music, through sound and making than we do now. A little bit further along the line then, William Bird saying, you know, exercise of singing is delighted to nature and good to preserve the health of man. It's the best means to procure a perfect pronunciation. There is not any music or instruments whatsoever comparable in that which is made for by the voice that sings, said singing is so good a thing, I wish all men would learn to sing, which is, I think, uh, and one of the, uh, the prefaces of, of birds, uh, songs and songs, was it? I think. So, a holistic view of the mind and body together is a holistic view of mind and body, because we're going to jump a little bit further now and say, why music then, when we have mind and body sometimes not working like we would like it to, in terms of that, the plan. <coughs> Pimlico Skylarks, we're going to ask you to sing. Pimlico Skylarks is one of the founding groups of the organization which we're actually uh, launching officially today called Sing to Beat <coughs> Parkinson's, which I owe in to my dear friend and colleague Roger Clayton here, who actually came up with the 
this title, Sing to Beat Parkinson's. So thank you very much for that, Roger. Nicola, my colleague Nicola Weinbach is, is now uh, facilitating Pimlico Skylarks, <laughs> and would you like to? We actually have Pimlico Skylarks and Camberwell Skylarks. Um, so there are, there are two groups in um, Pakistan. Can uh, you, we, we're not a choir, so we, I'm going to do an exercise with uh, my guys, and I will, if you feel like it, to get you to join in as well. Uh, we're just going to start with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Here we go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Look, can you make it the most <coughs> exciting thing you've ever done? Can you do that for me? We get ready here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. We're gonna A A B A B C D E F G. Here we go. A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Do you know it now? You got it. Here we go. A B C D E F G H I J K L M. N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Brilliant, fantastic. You're not allowed to go yet. They're going to go first. Wait for it. Here we go. A B C D E F G H I J K L M. A B C D E F G H I J K L M. A B C D E F G H I J K L M. A B C D E F G H I J K L M. What should we do with the drunken sailor? What should we do with the drunken sailor? What should we do with the drunken sailor? I lie in the morning. Who rain up she rises? Who rain up she rises? Who rain up she rises? I lie in the morning. So here we go. Let's do that all together. Here we go. What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? A lie in the morning. Fantastic. Great. This side, I just want you to sing. Hooray! 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 A lie in the morning. Put him in the scuppers with a hose pipe on him. Here we go. One, two. Put him in the scuppers with a hose pipe on him. Put him in the scuppers with a hose pipe on him. Put him in the scuppers with a hose pipe on him.
qualitative um, uh, research that there were uh, very similar responses coming out. And we were able to identify these, 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 these areas on the right hand side. Before that though, I forgot to mention Mr. Kellogg of Cornflakes uh, fame, who actually said this extraordinarily beautiful thing in 1932. I'm particularly impressed with the value of singing. It's not only a diversion and wholesome mental occupation, and on this account health promoting, but it is also excellent lung gymnastics and promotes not only breathing, but the circulation as well. It especially aids circulation through the liver, stomach, and other digestive organs, and so promotes digestion. <laughs> we should have that on every conflict. <laughs> every morning you should be reading that. Well, we didn't, we hadn't read that at that time, but we came up with these, these six areas. The benefits for well-being and relaxation, we got benefits for breathing and posture, very similar. Social benefits, spiritual benefits, emotional benefits, benefits for the heart and immune system. All those things were captured in our qualitative uh, uh, analysis of the work. And so we set up a research centre in the basin in Folkestone, funded by the marvellous Roger de Haan, uh, uh, now Sir Roger de Haan, and uh, having written a, a, a pretty convincing, I think, uh, business plan, he funded the, the research because his father died from a, a form of dementia, and his father was wedded to, to music right until the, his, the end of his life. And so we, we set up this research centre to look at the particular use of singing uh, with other areas. Of things. So what's come out of this is work that my colleagues have been involved in. Trish was coming today, but Matthew Shipton's here, been working on uh, various areas of, of, uh, of, of the, the use of singing as an intervention with people with singing mental health. We did the first randomised trial control ever of singing and the impact of singing on mental health. Singing and compulsive, uh, uh, sorry, COPD. Singing dimension, singing and Parkinson's in that way. And, and those are all available on, on, online in this way. And then we repeated, the, the first piece of research we did, we repeated on a very large scale in England, Germany, and Australia. And so, we had now something like 1,300 participants, and using the same measures, the same qualitative analysis, the, the first results of that first initial research were actually compounded, and we found these particular things in the same way that we're coming out. <laughs> so, in a minute, yeah. So we've got evidence, we've got evidence uh, absolutely uh, written through research methodologies. We've got evidence carrying out, but we've also got wonderful practical evidence of the impact of, of singing as a very simple means of, of making the quality of life be improved. And when the quality of life is improved, it seems to me that the potential for the, the development of better health is there. And we've got a wonderful example here. Helen is here from Singing Medicine. And if you don't, if you, if you don't take anything else away with you from this evening, just take this away.
A lot of them are bed bound. So their parents can't always visit for some of the children that are quite appalling. So they have other children that have got other commitments outside. So getting the senior teachers to come in and see their children is a really positive thing. And you can see their faces lights up when they come around and sing songs. Can you blink your eyes? Should we try that? Can you blink your eyes? Just like me. Just like me. Can you blink? Just like me. I think that it's it's the, the joy and the spirit of singing and people feeling lifted and and for a moment perhaps they can they can enter into that place of real pure enjoyment and sing. Yeah, well, just take that. You say ah, oh, oh. yeah, absolutely, quite extraordinary. The impact of singing with really children who are really very poorly. We've got great examples we can think about that. Another example is actually music in the brain, working with Alzheimer's. Yeah. <coughs> we've, got the, we've got the examples. We've got Parkinson's groups that we've set up, with Roger and I set up Skylark. Prescription. We've got, we've got smoking on cessation on prescription. 
we've got obesity on prescription. The Daily Mirror, for instance, suggests that overweight Brits are going to give free gym lessons for the for, uh, next one. <laughs> 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 and for Parkinson's, we have Lee Silverman vocal technique, which is a, an amazing, amazing, amazing impact upon speech development. And the National Health prescribes it, you know, but it's very expensive because it's one to one. It's four times a week for four for a month. Is that right, Roger? Four so, yeah, so, so quite expensive. Quality evidence suggests us that, that singing can have not the same necessarily, but as effective way of encouraging development of the voice and ex I I increasing the voice. And that's what we'll, we'll try to release the, that suggestion next week in Australia. So, my conclusion is, the way forward is, one, music is a powerful but underused tool, not only for people with dementia, but for us all. That was last week's report. Secondly, we need to lobby. We've got to go out and tell it, whoever it is, GPs, commissioners, friends, relations, politicians, that we need singing. We need to create a Facebook petition from tonight so we get 10,000 signatures for get singing. We need to tweet. Tom's just learning to tweet. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> and we need to ask and why not see me on prescription? Yes. Thank you very much.